The Tom Woods Show, episode 1216. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, when you're on social media defending the libertarian position on health care, oh, you get called all kinds of fun names. Well, I've got just the antidote. My free ebook, Your Friends Are Wrong About Health Care. Check it out at yourfriendsarewrong.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Well, I've got a neat little talk for you today. Oh, my goodness. This one's about six years old. You can see how long it took me to start my podcast. Early on in this one, I say, yeah, you know, I think I'll probably have my own show. Yeah, it didn't happen for like a year and a half. So when on my entrepreneurship email list, if you're on that one, when I tell you once in a while that some of my best advice is just go ahead and do whatever the thing is that you're planning on doing, instead of waiting until every duck is in a row, so to speak, just understand that's coming from hard experience. Okay, I mean, I had the idea for this show so long before it actually occurred, before I actually launched it. It's embarrassing to look back at this talk from something like April 2012. The episodes didn't start getting cranked out till September 2013. <laughs> and I'm sounding like I'm on the verge of doing it. Oh, my goodness. So that's just, uh, that's not good. And the second thing is, and I make another mistake early on, I say that the song Siberian Katru from Yes came out in 1971. Of course, that's not true. That's when they released the Fragile album. Siberian Katru is on Close to the Edge from 1972. What's the matter with me? However, the rest of the stuff is on target. This is an event in Philadelphia sponsored by the 10th Amendment Center. And I'm talking about state nullification of unconstitutional federal laws. And I'm talking about decentralization and civilization and how they are linked together. A lot of interesting stuff, I think. And I feel like every once in a while, I want to pull one of these out of the vault to keep some of my issues that I don't talk about as much these days, keep them still burning a bit. And nullification certainly is one of those. I wrote a book called Nullification in 2010, about not about jury nullification, about the powers of the states to nullify unconstitutional federal laws. This was Jefferson's view. And I think that's a pretty darn good book. There are some historical documents as appendices in the end. And I guarantee you, you've never seen these documents before. I guarantee they were in no documentary reader that was in any school you attended or is in any school around the country, really. But they are historical documents all the same. I dug them up. They're real. And they show that I'm not making this stuff up. It's just that nobody knows about these documents. So I dug them up, put them in there, doggone it. And in particular, I think chapter, I think it's four, has some of the most helpful American history themes anybody can get, in which I talk about the argument for the so-called compact theory of the union as opposed to the nationalist theory of the union. The compact theory is so overwhelmingly obviously correct, but that chapter is where I really, for the first time, laid it out systematically. Uh, I had written about it here and there, but I had never done a systematic overview and defense of it. And I think it's the best short such summary. There are longer ones. There are book-length ones from the 19th century. But in terms of a 21st century work that gives you the information you need to defend this position and to understand it, I think it's the best thing that there is. Now, I'm not really bragging there because it's probably the only one. <laughs> but I just mean if you're interested in this stuff, which you darn well should be, I think that chapter is going to just save you a lot of grief. It's got all the information you need, all the history to show that you're right in the way you think about the American Union. Now, it doesn't matter if you're an anarcho-capitalist or not. Stefan Kinsella is an anarcho-capitalist, but he's interested in this stuff too, just from a historical perspective. Which one is the correct view? Oh, I like to be correct, and I think this one is the correct view, that um, the constituent parts of the Union are the states, and the United States was not meant to be one giant blob ruled indivisibly from the center. That's just not true. And the states do have the ability to resist. And so there's a lot of good stuff in there. So um, if you like the ideas in this talk, then you will enjoy that book. You can get the audiobook version for free when you sign up for the great Audible offer at TomWoodsAudio.com. By the way, when it comes to audiobooks, sometimes the people who read them, it's like they're reading the instructions for a microwave oven. It's, you just don't understand why they have to be so dull. So I actually wound up reading, or narrating one of my books, and that's my book, Real Descent, which is my favorite one of my books, by the way. And if you don't have any of my books, I, I don't make much money on books, 
but I do think they help people. That's why I wrote them. And I think you would enjoy reading them if you like this show. And in particular, I think Real Descent is the best thing I've done. It's because it's it's a bunch of short pieces from you know probably the past ten years or more on a variety of topics. A lot of hitting the neocons, just really good like responses to libertarian critics or critics of libertarianism. And there are some really delicious and fun smackdowns in there. And I think you really get a kick out of it. So Real Descent is the best best one I've got. And I actually did the reading of that one. So if you go to tomwoodsaudio.com and you type in Real Descent, that'll actually be me reading that book. And uh, that's a little bit more, it's not crazy, but it's a little bit more lively than the typical audiobook reader. Just say that. All right. That's that. I really hope you enjoy this talk. Here we go. This is a dangerous man, citizen. Avert your eyes. Don't you dare listen to this man. Avert your eyes, citizen. He's extreme. He's dangerous. He's crazy. He's not respectable. Thanks, everybody. Wow. All right. You get extra credit in my eyes if you know what song that is. Anybody know what that is? Siberian yes, that's right. Siberian Katru by Yes from 1971. All right. Woo. That is good. I've always wanted to be introduced to that music. That is great. I don't even know what a Katru is, but that's what a Siberian one sounds like. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I want to say a special thank you to the Foundation for a Free Society and to the Tenth Amendment Center for making this event possible, uh, to Michael Bolden for introducing me three minutes ahead of schedule, and I was kind of, you know, putting the last-minute thoughts in, and I guess those are not going to be, those thoughts are not going to be had. But th And then thanks to all the co-sponsors. I mean, a lot of groups in this area came together to make this event possible, and that is very, very heartwarming and very glad to see so many people who are going to take their Saturday and say, you know what, I'm going to take this Saturday, roll it up into a ball, and just throw it out the window in the form of spending it inside a hotel all day listening to these people, because you know the significance of what's going on here. Now, if only, you know, uh, this is great. Now, next year, we've got to double this, and then we're going to double it after that, and then, then we'll start having some fun. But this is wonderful to see such a great cadre being built up, thinking about these ideas. I have a little bit of good news going on here. Um, uh, st starting sometime, maybe, maybe next month or something, a lot of people have been saying, because I sometimes fill in for Peter Schiff on the Peter Schiff show, people say, well, why don't you get your own show? So, I, okay, so it looks like it's going to work out that I'll have some type of show. So I put up a, uh, well, thank you, thank you. So I had to outfit my home office to make this possible. So I put up a chip in for, here. look, I hope you guys can help me out because, I mean, I'm going to be doing the show for free. It's hard for me to be sort of out of pocket if we can all chip in a little something to make this possible. In one afternoon, the target was reached. I was able to get everything I needed. And then the very last minute, there was, it was $600 left to go. It's just incredible the miracles the Internet makes possible. Some guy from Norway contributed the final 600 bucks. I mean, I was just, I mean, without the internet, think of how different life would be without the internet. Without the internet, that guy would have blown that 600 bucks on a whole lot of Norwegian crap. I don't know, Viking helmets, what do they buy in Norway? But instead, I got my show, thanks to this. So it's really, really quite something. The other thing I want to point out is that I've been doing a lot of uh, work on this subject of nullification since I wrote uh, a book on nullification. I've been able to talk a lot about it thanks to Michael Bolden and all these guys, Jason Rink, who have helped to make this tour possible, and that's been a lot of fun. But I've, I've noticed that the political left, you have to hand it to them, they believe in their principles because a lot of times they say that what we need for the economy is more government spending. More government spending on make-work jobs, and that will boost and stimulate the economy. Well, I have to respond to a lot of inane criticisms of nullification, and I am now of the belief that those articles are actually a disguised form of make-work for me. <laughs> They're writing these inane things to put me to work 
to give me something to do. And for heaven's sake, you know, I, I, I can't help myself. Somebody says some inane thing, I, 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 you know, I got to respond to it. And that's why half the time people will email me and say, you won't believe what this bum is saying. You got to go respond to him. But if I don't have the time to do it, I can't even open the email. Like I, or I can't even open the link because it's just going to eat away at me all day, all the things I could be saying in response to this. Guy. Like I can't do it to myself. I won't be sleeping. And then inevitably I'll wind up writing the article anyway, and I'll be groggy the next day. Horrible, horrible. So it's been great to have the opportunity to, to uh, engage people in discussion about this, uh, both pro and con. Now, I think at the end of the day, I think we probably already know what the concept is, right? I mean, at this point, if we don't know what the concept is, then this has been a one big stinking failure. <laughs> but for the sake of the, I don't know, presumably YouTube audience that may view this, uh, I'm going to give you like the three-minute, and I'm actually going to look at my watch here. I'm going to give you the three-minute overview of what we're talking about here. And because basically what I try to do each time now, at Fort Worth, when we kicked off this tour in September 2010, Uh, or August 2010, um, I gave basically the thorough overview. Like, here's the whole deal. And I gave that, and that's up there on my website permanently, tomwoods.com. It's one of the videos on the homepage. That's there. The problem with YouTube is that everybody can watch it. So then you go give another speech. People say, that's the same speech he gave in Fort Worth. (laughs) So it's very hard. Like, if you're a stand-up comedian, good luck in the age of YouTube. (laughs) I already heard this guy's routine. Like, what is he supposed to come up with new jokes every single night? So I got to think of how do I talk about nullification differently when it's still the same thing each time? How do I do that? So what I'm going to do is, as I say, just let's go through the basics, and then I'm going to try and tackle it from a different angle each time. So, all right, so here we go. So according to my watch, I'm at like, it's like 602 and a half or some kind of thing like that. So basically the idea is this. So It comes down to the insight that the federal government cannot be expected to limit itself. You know, now I can understand somebody being skeptical of this in 1790. But, you know, we have a little bit of experience in this area now, and I think this is rather an understatement, if anything. So something outside itself has to do the limiting. It can't be the courts. Oh, the courts will put things right. Oh, let's everybody wait with bated breath to hear what our overlords have to say about what our Constitution means. Jefferson's view is that the Constitution was written in a way that the average person could understand it. You don't need some deep insight that you have to go into debt for for three years to acquire. None of that. Just read the words. Read and also read what was said about them, what uh, said about those words in the state ratifying conventions. And in fact, how has the leave it to the court strategy worked? Most of the time when the federal government gets away with something, it cites the Commerce Clause. It, the Commerce Clause it takes up about this much space in the Constitution. It takes up this much space in how the federal government justifies its activities. And in 60 years, starting in the 30s, going to the 1990s, the Supreme Court declared one federal law unconstitutional on Commerce Clause grounds, the Gun-Free School Zones Act of 1990. They combed everything. That was the only thing they could find the federal government had done wrong. So if you like a strategy where every 60 years your liberties might be protected, then by all means, don't listen to anything I have to say. Don't buy the nullification book. Don't do any of this. Or maybe maybe twice if you're lucky, twice in 60 years. Well, it's just unlikely this is going to happen. And Jefferson and his followers believe that more likely – was the outcome that whereby the federal courts would just rubber stamp what the rest of the federal government was doing. No surprise there. So what logically bears the responsibility of keeping the federal government in check? Well, the states. The states created the federal government. I I go through all the steps of this in in nullification. The states are the, the sentinels that will say, now, wait a minute. In this particular state, we're just not letting you do this. And this really, it just boils down to common sense. It really is common sense. If If the federal government is doing something that it's not authorized to do, you don't wait around fruitlessly for years hoping that somehow it'll change because it doesn't. So we're going to try this. That's what it boils down to, the insight that the federal government cannot be allowed to have a monopoly on determining what its powers are. 
And the critics of nullification, they're against monopolies in every other aspect of life. They wouldn't want a shoe monopoly or anything else. But for some reason, on the most important issue of all, they think it's somehow antisocial to deny that we should have a monopoly. But we're saying, no, 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 there needs to be a division of power centers and not a centralized power deciding what the powers of the federal government are. All right, I did that in about two and a half minutes, so I'm going to leave, leave that there. So to make a long story even shorter, I'll just say that if we look through history, we find – and these are things, by the way, that you could find if you looked in the documentary histories. But typically this is not being done or we're not learning about this in our classrooms. But I've talked a lot about, thanks to the work of Kevin Gutzman, what went on in the Virginia Ratifying Convention. The Virginia Ratifying Convention. So Virginia is going to consider whether or not to ratify the Constitution. This is 1788. And in response to some of the skeptics of the Constitution, like Patrick Henry, who was concerned that some of these seemingly open-ended clauses, like the General Welfare Clause, would in effect authorize a government of unlimited powers, it was supporters of the Constitution, the Federalists, in the Virginia Convention that said, no, 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 don't worry about that because, number one, this is going to be a government of strictly enumerated powers. And, number two, it's going to have the, it's going to have the powers only expressly delegated to it. They used the word expressly in numerous ratifying conventions. And then George Nicholas, who became the first uh, Kentucky attorney general, said, and if the federal government should try to impose upon us any supplementary condition." anything that we didn't expressly agree to in this document, then we will be exonerated. Okay, well, that's pretty much what nullification is, and there you see it spelled out in the ratifying convention. So, I mean, this stuff is there. It's not like we're making this up. It's there. It's in, of course, the great resolutions of 1798, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions of Jefferson and Madison. Like, the evidence is just overwhelming. There's a very, very, very good case historically, Logically, strategically, morally, the case is just airtight for, for state nullification. Now, having said that, and there's – oh, gosh, there's so much more that can be said. But now what I want to do – this is my way of, of – it's like the variations that Mozart wrote on uh, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. You know, it's all Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. But each one's kind of a clever variation until by the end you think, I think I'm going to commit an atrocity if I hear one more variation on <laughs> – so I'm hoping that I'm not quite up to that level. This is my, my, like, be like my eighth or ninth variation on Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star, the nullification version. So what I want to talk about today is nullification has a special appeal, I think, for those people who have figured out certain basic truths. The first such truth is that the problem with our country today is not Barack Obama. Now, I don't mean to say Barack Obama's a great guy. I wish he'd move in next door to me. Although, actually, if he moved in next door to me, I mean, he wouldn't be president anymore. So I guess I, I take that back. I'll make that sacrifice for the country. But it's the whole, if it was just one bad president, we would be in a heck of a lot better position than we are now. So this whole Obama, like every time I go to Twitter, oh, Twitter, why am I even on it? I don't know. <laughs> You can follow me, by the way. I'm Thomas E. Woods on Twitter. I don't know why I'm on, because if, if you wind up having any, talk about frustrating. If you've never been on Twitter, everything you type on Twitter has to be 140 characters or fewer. 140, not words, characters, but letters and spaces. So, so, so try having a debate with somebody. Oh, yeah, you're, you are, a jerk. And I'm right, R-I-T-E, so I can save one character. I'm like, ah, why am I doing this to myself? But every time, you know, I basically on Twitter, I get a lot of people following me, and they're all different sorts of people, and I typically follow people back. I don't always have time to check them out. If they look totally insane, I don't follow them back. But I, basically, I follow people back. All right. So that means I get a lot of just like regular, I haven't yet seen the light sort of, mildly right of center people who are posting things about Obama's done this and Obama's done that. And I think, you know, a lot of these people, if, if George W. Bush had done half those things, they would, have said, they would have saluted and gone along with it. No problem. No dissent would have been allowed. And, you know, just today somebody said to me, 
why is it that when Jefferson and Madison wrote the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions of 1798 and they called on the states to resist the unconstitutional Alien and Sedition Acts, why were there so many states that just said, oh, th this is an appalling doctrine and we refuse to stand with Virginia and Kentucky on this? Why were so many states so unwilling to stand with them? And I think it's a question of whose ox was being gored. Because it turns out that, by and large, the New England states that denounced Virginia and Kentucky, how dare you suggest that you could resist an unconstitutional federal law? The New England states, 10 years later, when Jefferson has imposed an embargo on shipping in New England, well, suddenly they want to nullify that. And they're quoting from, oh, they're talking all about nullification and interposing and all that. So sometimes it boils down to people just don't have principles. It's, I don't have, I just favor my views, and that's all, that's all it boils down to. Where some of us think that even if a president should do something that we like, if it's unconstitutional, we don't even want him to do it. Very few people, unfortunately, are going to have that, that sort of level of principle. And that's our problem, because we have gotten so caught up in the cult of personality around the president and around all the presidential candidates that we wind up at each other's throats with, oh, yeah, the problem with our country is the Democrats. I am so sick of that. Yes, I obviously, look, any kid, any 10-year-old with a connection to the Internet can see the Democrats are rotten. Like, we, duh. <laughs> if that was our, if we had one political party that was consistently good, Again, we'd be in much better shape than we are now. I, I just cannot get over people who think Obama is the worst person ever to walk the earth, and then they go out and hold a sign for an op opposing candidate whose views of government are about 7% different. Okay, I don't know if this is Robert Scott Bell's water, if it's spiked with silver or what's in here, but... <laughs> All right. Okay. But if I, if I have some Popeye effect, you know, and suddenly, you know, then we'll know. But, I mean, think about... Look, I don't want to go through all the... Like, we all know the history. I mean, like, Richard Nixon, the great conservative, who gave us, what, the EPA wage and price controls, affirmative action, and he almost gave a guaranteed income to every American. Uh, after, and I know uh, there are some people I'm not supposed to criticize, but what fun, would, where would, what would be the fun in that? If I didn't say something that wouldn't challenge anybody in the room, I mean, come on, let's have a little fun here, criticizing people. Uh, so like, after, like at the end of Reagan's term, now Reagan is like infallible, every candidate compares himself to Reagan, Th that's dangerous. That's the way the left acts toward Obama. This sort of cult of personality, he's perfect. You just wave incense in front of him, citizen. You're not worthy to speak of him. You know, we can't do that, right? Well, surely we are above that, right? In this room, we're above that sort of thing. So by the end of Reagan's terms, the budget has doubled. The tax rate reductions of the early years have been overcome by later uh, increases and, and uh, cancellation of loopholes and so on. The executive branch continues to grow in power. George H.W. Bush gives us massive new regulations, new taxes, more centralization. George W. Bush, well, let's see, Medicare Part D, no child left behind, further centralization of education, spending levels unseen since Lyndon Johnson, appeal to a vast reservoir of unspecified powers in the executive branch. I mean, come on, right? And now the same people, the same geniuses who've gotten us in this spot are prepared to nominate another Bob Dole, John McCain, George W. Bush clone. And I might add parenthetically that, uh, well, well, one good thing about George W. Bush was his foreign policy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because I feel so much safer now that Iraq no longer has a two-bit nobody, and instead they now have a Shiite regime whose constitution pledges fidelity to the Koran. Oh, so much safer. Thank heavens we had that. And people will say, well, we couldn't have known that in advance. Uh, yes, we could. Everybody was saying that. Every sensible conservative said that's exactly what the outcome will be, trillions of bucks later, and, and whoever. Uh, so anyway, the point is, what we're dealing with is two wings of the same bird of prey. A, 
And yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, one of the wings, you know, the people give an occasional pretty speech because they think we're a bunch of dupes who all we do is listen to pretty speeches and then pull a lever. Well, okay, I, I would assume that at least in this room we're not that way. But nothing pleases these people more than to see Americans divided over these trivial differences. And nothing terrifies them more than somebody who just transcends the whole fake spectrum. Nothing makes Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell kiss and make up faster than a challenge by somebody who recognizes that the problem is not the Democrats or the Republicans. The problem is the system itself. That's what scares them. So that's the first insight. The second of these central truths that I think these nullify supporters, this is what attracts us, this is what binds us together, this is why we all rally around this cause, is that there is, there is merit in decentralized power. Decentralization is something that both wings of our bird of prey oppose. Oh, yeah, 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 the Rep Bob Dole in 1996 said that he carried his copy of the Constitution and the Tenth Amendment around in his back pocket. His back pocket, which was obviously sewn shut, which he never had access to. <laughs> so we're told, we're told that really the, all the cool people favor centralized power. Right, and only a loser would favor decentralized power. Don't we know that's stupid and backward and inefficient? And now since the 20th century, we've seen how cool it is to have large centralized states. If we pursue nullification, you will see, if you have not seen already, the true nature of the regime. Because the mainstream, so-called respectable establishment left will join hands with the mainstream, respectable establishment right against us. Well, I say, bring it on, baby. <laughs> Now, it is not, it is not, and you have to believe me, I am being absolutely genuine here, it is not my intention to politicize my remarks, but I do have to add that if we think of the presidential candidates right now, there is only one who would not condemn every one of you in this room as an extremist for supporting nullification. At the first moment that Keith Olbermann puts them on the spot, they will throw you under the bus. We all know it. Every one of them with one exception. Why do people support candidates who would smear and denounce them the moment they're put on the spot by Rachel Maddow? Why is that? It's like there is a nationwide Stockholm syndrome effect at work. The whole country, somehow now we identify with the very people who are wrecking our lives. I, 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 this is something I can't understand, so I'm going to just leave that aside. All right, now carrying on. Much of this prejudice against the idea of nullification, though, derives from the idea that the only way to organize society is to have a single, irresistible, infallible central authority ruling over a, a collection of individuals. That's the only way society can be arranged. And we dissent from that. I mean, we, we think that maybe there is another way of living, and in fact, there was through most of the history of Western civilization. That was not how political society was organized. When you look at the French Revolution, one of the major aspects of the French Revolution was flattening out and destroying all local privileges, liberties, differentiating aspects, and turning it into one single, irresistible, unbreakable blob. That was what the revolution ultimately yielded to the Western world, and since then, all the major countries have fallen in line. So instead of federations, we have centralized states everywhere. Now, when I used to be a college professor, a lot of my kids, students I should say, um, thought that the United States was awesome because, and here was their reason, because it's a great big country. That's what makes us so cool, we're a great big country. But there are a lot of great big countries in the world you wouldn't want to be caught dead in, right? <laughs> the Soviet Union was a great big country. China's a great big country. Okay, well, China's getting better than it used to be. I mean, certainly better than during the Cultural Revolution, obviously. But the point is, there are great big countries nobody would want to live in. That's not what makes the United States great. Well, the United States was, and this is how I appeal to people who are fixated on American exceptionalism. We hear this a lot, right? American, America is the most awesome country in the world. 
But yet, a lot of people who say that are willing to sit back and watch America become exactly like every other country in the world. If the United States is supposed to be this light to the nations or something different in the world, why is it, why are we sitting back as it's being organized exactly like Britain, France, Germany? Whatever? So the way I appeal to these American exceptionalist neocon types is I say, you really think the United States is supposed to be organized like France? And they think, oh my gosh, no, what have I been thinking? France? Worst possible thing. But like, the world is full of centralized states, right? What it's not full of are countries that are, like the United States was supposed to be, that are collections of societies, that are not just an undifferentiated aggregate of individuals, but are collections of self-governing peoples. That's what made the United States distinct in the world. At a time when the world was moving towards centralization, the United States was moving in the opposite direction. That this is, the United States, if you look in the Constitution, not once is the United States referred to in the singular. It is always referred to in the plural to emphasize that that's what we are. We're a collection of things. We are not one thing. As my friend Don Livingston puts it, a collection of nations is not itself a nation in the, in the way that a collection of country clubs is not a country club. So this is a, what we live in is a federation, a federation of societies. But what has followed from this unthinking acceptance of this T Thomas Hobbes model where all power resides in the central authority. And if there are any powers exercised at the local level at all, they are concessions generously made by the center, but not anything that inheres in these lesser bodies. What follows from this is this kind of superstitious reverence for political bigness, the idea that giant states are like self-justifying goals. So any form of resistance to the central authority becomes viewed as being ipso facto perverse and unpatriotic. Now, in my third point, third point would be that we, again, that I think if, if you realize this truth, it draws you into nullification. This prejudice in favor of large centralized states as being self-justifying goals and thinking that anybody who resists that state, a state within a state, this is unthinkable. Even though, as I say, this is exactly how European civilization was organized. You had all different jurisdictions, some of them overlapping, uh, and, and they all their symbiotic relation all worked together to produce Western civilization. It was impossible in pre-modern Europe for any king, no matter how ambitious, to gather the authority to engage in, in, to impose an income tax or some of the things that we take for granted in our so-called free societies of today. But what we see, the third point is that this prejudice is not justified. Because we look at the 20th century, what was the fruit of these large centralized states? Well, total war on a scale that had never been seen before, genocide, I mean, just case after case, totalitarian systems, and totalitarian revolutions. Now, when you talk about state nullification, people say, we have to be careful of state nullification because what if the states begin to oppress racial minorities? And I've dealt with that topic in other talks that you can, uh, you can find on YouTube and on my, uh, some of my resource stuff on nullification online. But look around the world. How did these wonderful centralized states, how did they treat minorities? And in the nullification documentary, I gave four examples, and I've, I could give a bunch more, but my... I think the most telling examples are, ask the Ukrainians in the Soviet Union how they felt as a minority when they were starved to death deliberately in 1932 to 33. Uh, wouldn't it have been better for Ukraine to be able to nullify that policy? So, I mean, in other words, it's not obvious that minorities are safer in large centralized states. So the, the exact opposite seems to be obvious. Uh, ask, now, I'm, I myself am half Armenian, so I'm particularly sensitive to this point. Uh, think about how the Armenians fared in the Ottoman Empire. I mean, was, was, that, was that just a bowl of cherries? Or, I mean, obviously, the Asians who were expelled from Uganda, or obviously the Jews in Germany. I mean, this, these are not, this is not, it's not which, but we, we're not even allowed to entertain these questions. We're not even supposed to ask the question. The idea that the scale, the size of the political order could even be considered is not even on the table. If you even consider it, there's something wrong with you. You can, this is not even a, all you're supposed to ask is how much do you want the government to rip you off? That's basically what all political debates boil down to. I want them to rip me off slightly less than they are now. Yeah, yeah, let me hold that guy's sign. Yeah.
How many, how many of the great despotic figures of the 20th century ever called for power to be decentralized or ever said we should have the power of nullification on the part of the constituent bodies? Well, I believe the question answers itself. Now, my friend Don Livingston has just edited a good book on, uh, on rethinking the American Union in the 21st century where he raises some of these interesting issues. And we should consider, when we think about ancient Greek civilization, that was composed of over a thousand republics which existed in an age of great empires. And yet, if we look at just ancient Athens alone, which we could compare maybe to modern-day Rhode Island, Athens, the achievements in philosophy, drama, mathematics, architecture and art, and etc., are, are still being studied and appreciated and emulated to this day. So it's not true that large-scale political societies are necessary for the cultivation of human excellence or for human flourishing. Moreover, Greece twice defeated the Persian Empire, much larger than itself, against what seemed impossible odds in the early 5th century BC in the Persian Wars. The city-state of Venice flourished for 1,200 years before being conquered by Napoleon. Switzerland has maintained its independence in the heart of, of, of a volatile Europe for 700 years. Oh, but large states bring safety and security to their people. Really? Was France a safe place to live in the 20th century? Was Britain? Was Germany? Was the Soviet Union a safe place to live in the 20th century? Was China, where the, the, the resources of a mighty state were turned against its people? And even people who are concerned about the, the so-called asymmetric threats said to be posed to the United States today, well, is there any reason to believe that the bumbling bureaucracies of today's megastates would respond to these threats more effectively than would smaller polities? If so, I don't see the evidence for such a claim. Now, at some point in this century, it is likely that the U.S. population will reach 435 million people. That would be one million people for each of the 435 congressmen in the House of Representatives. Now, that figure was capped by Congress about 100 years ago. There, no matter how, what, so redistricting amounts to shuffling the 40, 435 around the different states, but not adding new ones. In what sense could political representation possibly be meaningful any longer, if it ever had any meaning, if each congressman represents one million people? Is this question even, again, you're crazy for considering that question. I would say you're crazy for not considering it. How can you represent, I mean, this is, it's absurd. So when we think about these overlooked facts, well, suddenly it's not so open and shut, is it? That the large-scale state is to be preferred. Now, the fourth insight. The textbooks are wrong. Well, I don't even have to finish that sentence, but I'm going to. <laughs> I'm going to. The textbook version says that these 435 people, we add another 100 for the senators, 535 people, they're there to legislate for the public good. And where would we be without them? Hopeless and lost, right? So these are selfless crusaders for justice. They are not in any way simply seeking their own perpetuation, these bureaucracies. No, 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 they are just looking out for us. They're not just looking to get a bigger budget each year. They're not looking to exaggerate or perpetuate the problems they were intended to solve because thereby they will get more pilf and power. No, 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 citizen, nope. These people are just laboring, toiling day and night for you and me. And again, where would we be without them? Well, you know, and this is my, my usual trope here. Uh, where would we be? Well, we'd all be probably dead in a ditch. We'd be earning three cents an hour. Uh, our kids would be working in mines, getting their limbs blown off, and all, our consumer products would all be exploding. If it weren't for OSHA, well, people would be, obviously all workers would be falling into the grinding machine, and so <laughs> all of us would be eating sausages made out of some guy's leg. <laughs> we wouldn't have any art in society, because really, what artist would even pick up a paintbrush if he doesn't have Joe Biden paternally watching over? <laughs> no scientific work would be done. I mean, like, on and on and on, right? That's what we're told. Now, I don't believe that stuff, okay? I, I think every single one of those claims is demonstrably false. But on top of it, the st modern state will also blame all problems, ne never on itself. 
It's always our fault. The financial crisis, that was our fault because they weren't watching over us closely enough. If only they had been able to crack a few more skulls, they could have stopped this. Sure, sure. We had financial crises year, year in, year out, time after time. But if only just a few more skulls could have been cracked. Or health care. Well, that's, again, that's because the free market caused that problem. Educa- the kids aren't learning anything. That's because why else? Our wise overlords don't have enough power, can't crack enough skulls, can't grab enough dough. It's always something like that. It's just like in the old Soviet Union. Nothing was ever the Soviet government's fault. The bad harvest, that wasn't there. It wasn't wasn't the crazy, insane Soviet collectivization policy where you herd all these people into collective farms and they hate it and it's like a giant prison they have to work in every day and they don't enjoy the fruits of their labor. It's nothing to do with that. No, it's bad weather, citizen. Bad weather. Sabotage. (laughs) But that's how they all act. Some of them are not as crude as others. They all act that way. What I have done in uh, title number two of my recent years, I've I've been writing like a book a year. People say, when's your next book coming out? I don't know. I'm surprised I'm still here. Like, It's incredibly draining mentally to keep writing these books. So I've decided that's it. There's not going to be another one for a while. I'm going to take a rest. I can't even think about a large-scale project anymore. But that's why this book, Rollback, which was packaged all wrong, they've packaged it to sound... I produced what I think is a fairly radical manuscript, which in the, in the old sense of the term, going back to the root. Because what, what, what I've done in here is the first sort of chapter goes into, well, here are the things that are bad about Obama. So, all right, okay, yeah, I'm with you so far. Like, you know, uh, stimulus is all wrong and the health care plans are wrong. Okay. And the next chapter is, here's some other things. You know, like, here's why all this, you know, the, the, uh, the financial crisis was, wasn't caused by this or that or the other thing. It was caused by the crummy government and its crummy central bank. And, all right, all right, whatever. And the next chapter is, all right, now here's another thing we got to get rid of, the Federal Reserve. All right, okay, maybe, right, right, right. And the next chapter is, and then the military-industrial complex is also looting the heck out of you, too. And, okay, whoa. And then finally, at the end... The, last cha- the, the second to last chapter is basically saying, and if I left anything out, we've got to abolish that also. <laughs> so, so that's basically what rollback is about. It's basically saying the federal government is like a giant de-civilization agent. It corrupts and destroys everything it touches, all the while telling us how much worse things would be without it. And they've trained us to think this, to have so little confidence in ourselves. We think, well, I don't like paying taxes to Joe Biden either, but my gosh, without him, where would my, you know, my kids would be dead and I'd be in a ditch. Like, you know, of course they want you to think that. I mean, just put yourself in their position, right? If you were running a racket like this, wouldn't you want the public to think, without me, you'd all be dead and it would all be helpless and the captains of industry would be exploiting you with giant whatever claws and whatever? Like, this is exactly what you would want people to think, and this is what we've been trained to think, and that's why I did this rollback book. So basically, so the two books kind of work together. So rollback is saying, here's what they're doing to us, and here's the refutation of all their crummy rationalizations for it. So every time your friend who says, oh, no, but if we got rid of the Fed, well, we'd have this or that. No, this is, the point of this is to win debates so that you can say, no way, baby, we can solve these problems without these uh, sociopaths running our lives. And then nullification is sort of saying, here's one way we can start pushing these people back. Now, one thing that nullification does help us do is those are my four basic insights here. One one additional thing, though, that it helps us do is as we talk about it and as we read and learn about it, we are uncovering forgotten history. And somebody today said to me, and I put it in a way that I would never have thought of, that when you study the history of nullification and the, the, and the compact theory of the union and all this stuff that goes with it, you realize this is actually really the – this isn't just some footnote to American history. This is actually the Rosetta Stone that decodes American history for you, that makes sense of it all, that you see the significance of, of things for the first time. And you look through the history of it and you realize how much is left out. Yeah, you get a passing glance at the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions of 1798 in your textbook. And even there, it's treated badly, inaccurately. It's portrayed as some sort of one-off thing Jefferson just did, you know, in a, in a fit of peak one day, and then that was the, the end of it. But you don't learn about the New England states talking about it around 1807 into 1808. You don't hear about it coming up again in 1812. Uh, you don't hear about it coming up again when Daniel Webster talked about what the states should do if the federal government tried to uh, initiate military conscription, which he believed, Webster believed to be unconstitutional. 
Um, you don't hear about in 1820, the legislature of Ohio passed a resolution saying the majority of Americans believe in the principle of nullification. You don't hear about in the, in the 1850s, the state of Wisconsin, the, the legislature declared the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 to be in many particulars unconstitutional, void and of no effect, and the state Supreme Court upheld that. And on and on, like n none of this, right, this may as well be a, a country on Mars. Like this doesn't sound like the United States at all. Like no one's ever hears this stuff. But as you hear it, it makes you think, well, gosh, what else have I not heard about? What, what is the deal here? This is the Rosetta Stone. What I think we need to do at this point is to take this knowledge to show people, well, you know what, American history is a lot more interesting than you thought. There's a lot going on that we haven't been let in on. Why haven't we been let in on this? What is the agenda behind the normal establishment version of American history? What is the agenda? And it's, they're not particularly subtle about it. Decentralization is stupid and backward, and the progressive way forward is for all you stupid rubes to centralize power in our hands. That's the lesson of the establishment version of American history, and that version cannot be smashed hard enough and buried deeply enough, and that's what we have to be engaged in. So, we have to, we have to influence public opinion so that people break free of these intellectual shackles that have been placed on us, placed on our minds, whereby we can't even think of any other way of living other than 309 million people being infallibly governed by one small group. And we can't even think of any other way. Anybody who thinks any other way, there's something wrong with him, he's an enemy of society. And I don't know, little by little, we gotta undo that. So, I mean, one thing I've suggested, this is not the entirety of our strategy, I assure you, but start using the word nullify in casual conversation. <laughs> I'll give you an example. Yeah, bartender, I'll have a uh, Jim Beam on the rocks, please. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, I think I want to nullify that order. Instead, I'll have a something like that. So the word starts to roll off the tongue a little bit more. Also, this becomes our way of identifying each other across the great expanse of this country. <laughs> All right, so you know, the Freemasons have their funny hand gestures, whatever. We got the word nullify. <laughs> one, one, my, one of my action items for you today is if you have not done so, I want to urge you to look at the way that, that I went after established opinion and the established media uh, pushing nullification forth. I want to urge you to go to a website called interviewwithazombie.com. <laughs> This is your action item for the day, interviewwithazombie.com. I'm not going to tell you about it now. A lot of you have seen it. But that's what we can do. That sort of thing cracks through the monopoly because when you laugh at them, they hate that. They hate that. They hate being made to look stupid. Now, I want you guys to think as we wrap up here. I want you to think about the set of people who are likely to oppose us if we engage in nullification. I want you to imagine those people in your head. Then separately, I want you to imagine the set of people who are responsible for reducing the American Republic to its present condition. What do you notice about those two groups? It's the same people. <laughs> so their opposition to us is a medal on our chests, okay? It is not anything to be afraid of. We need, first and foremost, to be educated, I mean, when I wrote nullification, it was because I noticed that as a historian, all I do is I talk about old things. And I, I used to talk about nullification as a historical issue. Then I noticed that there were Tea Party groups linking to my videos on nullification saying, hey, this sounds like something pretty good we could try now. I thought, my gosh, I never thought I would live to see this. So I, I thought, all right, I'm going to write the book that basically makes all the arguments so that when the jerks attack these people, they can defend themselves. So we've got to be, we've got to be edgy. We have to impress people. We have to say, all right, that guy knows what he's talking about. That law professor is obviously a stuffed shirt who's never read anything other than some establishment constitutional law textbook, which, by the way, bears zero resemblance to the actual Constitution, I assume you know. Um, we have to be able to wipe the floor with these people in public exchanges. That doesn't mean we have to be rude, but we have to be decisive victors, and it's easy to do this. But also, at the same time, we need to keep disagreements among ourselves civil and respectful, because nobody in this room is, is the problem right now, okay? The fact that you guys had the presence of mind to come to this thing is fantastic. And we should 
assume that we're all friends here and not look for reasons to say, well, my group has a 3% different view of things than your group does. All right, well, let's have a let's talk about that over coffee. Let's not rip each other's heads off over this. Let's not be like the Marxists. You know, you have one 0.03% deviation and you are like the worst ever, banished forever. And if we ever get in power, you are the first ones in the gulag. We're not going to, we're not like that. Come on. But also we have to be determined and not easily discouraged. Keep yourselves posted on nullification efforts by going to 10thamendmentcenter.com where they keep this stuff very much on the radar. Um, you can follow me at tomwoods.com. I have a big announcement coming April the 9th, so I hope you'll, you'll tune in for that. But ultimately, let's forge ahead together with a courage born of camaraderie and a just cause and fully aware of where we stand in the great flow of history as participants in the struggle of liberty against power, a struggle that began long before we were born and will persist long after we're dead. And what an honor it is for all of us to play this role in history and how great it is for me to be joined in that task by all of you. So onward and thank you very much. All right, folks, that's going to do it for today. If you're waiting for publicity for your website, I will get to, I think, the ones I have left by probably the end of this week. So I've got some fresh weeks coming up. If you want to start that website, go ahead and grab your hosting through the link you'll find at tomwoods.com slash publicity, and then you'll get free publicity from me along with other valuable bonuses, including our mutual help group and some tutorials and the SEO juice you get from being linked to on my site. So those benefits are at tomwoods.com slash publicity. If you enjoy what I'm doing, check out supportinglisteners.com. You get a lot of benefits and our secret group where all kinds of mischief takes place. That's over at supportinglisteners.com. I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.